really, really happy you all could make it to today's session, getting the most out of Patch. So uh, let's go ahead and get things started, shall we? I'd like to introduce Duncan and Gene onto the stage. All right, what do we got? We'll leave that there. Hopefully not spill it on anything. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're Australian to start with. Uh, so we speak something that's vaguely resembling English, so you may or may not understand us. We um, apologize in advance. <laughs> You never know. Um, so we're from a small tech company in Melbourne, which is the good part of Australia, the really good part of Australia. Um, and um, I'm the technical director and one of the founding partners. And Gene and I have been working on and off together for what almost 14 years. Almost, almost 14 years. Um, so hopefully we're not too much of an odd couple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, I've, I've realised how bright the stage lights are, so this may be difficult. Um, I like to be a little bit interactive, uh, so I'm going to ask for a few shows of hands, and the very first one is, um, how many people here are actually using Patch? Sort of. Okay, good. Um, that's, a, that's a fairly rare balance. Uh, sorry, reasonable balance. Um, second question is, how many of you are going to have questions? Now, I ask this because last year's Q&A on this topic ran way over time. Um, so I just want to know how fast we have to blow through the presentation in order to answer as many questions as we possibly can. So how many of you are going to have questions after this? Good, all right, we can just run to time and get the <laughs> hell out of here and not have to think on our feet too much and all of those things. Um, anyway, so the agenda for today. Um, we're going to basically go through a few things. Uh, one is creating patch definitions. There are ways to do this. Um, we're going to show you one or two. Um, leveraging those in Jamf Pro. Um, so this is all about external sources rather than the internal stuff. You can use the internal stuff, don't care. Um, and then we're going to touch on some things that you can do using the API to reduce like, or to streamline your workflows for leveraging said patch definitions within Jamf. So we're going to run through everything in the UI, and then we're going to run through everything in the API. Same stuff. Um, so you can cross-reference it and see what you're doing. All right. Um, let's start with some reference materials. Now I've worked out which screen's which and what's on and what's on next. Um, first of all, uh, there's the Jam process for, patch man uh, for updating the patch management software titles, which is an article at um, Jamf Nation, which details the process that Jamf undertake for doing the internal documentation. Um, and that shows you the, um, like the process they go through. This is kind of important because it'll help you understand what sort of testing goes through and why there's that little bit of a lag between things. If you hit that article, you're in the right place. Second one uh, is the documentation for external patch sources. Now, I call this out because it describes the structure of the JSON and all of those bits and pieces, and you can then understand just exactly how complicated it is. And it's complicated for a reason. Software titles <laughs> or software vendors are not overly consistent. Um, and so it requires a complex structure in order to, I guess, deal with what possible anomalies could come through. So there's no real flat way to do it. There has to be a lot of other information in it. Um, that is the appropriate article. If you want to have a, a good read and bend your head out of shape and understand a JSON object structure. Now, um, there are multiple ways to create patch definitions. I'm actually going to hand over to Gene to walk through our way. Lovely. Thank you, Duncan. So as Duncan said, vendors don't necessarily create packages or installer software which has you know consistent versioning. You might get inconsistent versioning between versions, subversions. It's complex. There's a lot to consider when you're making patch definitions. And there's a number of ways you can go about actually creating them. Um, they're all based on JSON, but obviously, you know, maybe you don't want to sit there and hand cut JSON. Um, you know, that's not perhaps what you got into the field for. So we're busy Mac admins. We're Mac admins. We like GUI-based things. So um, one of the things that sort of we worked on was this open source project that's on GitHub called Kenobi. Now, um, full disclosure, we are massive nerds in Mondata. Um, just having said that, though, this is not based on um, something from uh, a Jedi master. This is actually from the Japanese Kenobi, which is loosely translated as 
functional beauty, um, and we did kind of take that to heart when we designed this product. So, what is Kenobi in open source? Well, you'll see that it's a very clean interface for putting up your patch definitions, um, but it's don't let simplicity fool you. There's a lot behind the scenes going on. So, let's go ahead and get started. So, what we want to do is, by way of example, let's create a patch definition for Microsoft Remote Desktop, because that's something a lot of people kind of use. So, let's go ahead and hit New, and you'll see that what we can do here is we'll fill in the name of the title, the publisher, um, the application name and bundle identifier. Now, these are optional fields. However, the reason we do recommend including these is that it will auto-populate fields down the track, as we'll see, um, which will definitely speed up the amount of time it takes you to create patch definitions. You also notice that there is the current version and also an internal ID, and in this case, we've gone with RDC. So once created, you'll notice that it's marked with a little uh, exclamation mark telling us that we, it's not active yet and we can't activate it. Um, and you'll notice that we've had instant feedback. Up the top, it's telling us that we've created the software title. So let's dive on into that new software title we've created, and it's telling us it's disabled. Now, why is it disabled and why can't we enable it? Well, a software title needs two things to get started. One is the requirements, and the other are some patches themselves. So let's dive into the requirements. So a requirement is, as you might expect, what determines which computers in your environment are capable of having the software installed. So let's go ahead and create one. So in this case, we're going to go with the application bundle ID, which, as I'm sure we all know with Microsoft Remote Desktop, is com.microsoft.rdc.macOS. So that's what we constitute as uh, being Microsoft Remote Desktop. So now that we have that defined, we can go ahead and start creating some actual patches. So when we refer to patches, what we're really talking about is one version of the software. So in this case, let's go ahead and get a patch underway. So what do we need to include? Well, for a given patch, we'll need, of course, the version number itself, which in this case will go with 10.3.4. Uh, when we, this software was actually released, is it standalone? Uh, or is it a Delta update? Does it require a reboot? Um, obviously, some applications are more complex than others, especially if they have KEX and things like that that may need a reboot. Um, and also the minimum operating system for the patch. And you'll notice in this case, uh, for this particular version of RDC, it's uh, Sierra. So that's been created. That's really cool. But you'll notice we can't enable it yet. There's still more to do. So we've created 10.3.4. So let's dive on in. And again, it's telling us it's disabled. What do we need to have a valid patch? Well, again, components and capabilities. So a component is the first thing we'll go ahead and define. Um, and what we're really talking about here is what makes up 10.3.4. So we'll go ahead and create a new component for 10.3.4. And again, you'll notice that this has auto-populated with the data we entered earlier, which saves a bit of time. So we'll hit Save. And again, before we can enable this, we need to fill out more information. So we'll dive into that particular component. and then we'll jump in and see that we need to define some criteria for that particular component. So what, what do we mean by that? Well, criteria is basically what we're, what we're uh, defining as uh, exact version. Exact version. Thank you, Duncan. That's exactly right. So in this case, we're going to go with the application bundle ID, which again, it's auto-populated, which is rather handy. And we're going to go with the application version, which of course is 10.3.4. Simple as that. Not quite. Um, so I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. Uh, so there's a little note about inventory data, um, because we saw some chatter about this on Jamf Nation, I don't know, a couple of months back when this happened. Um, so inside the application contents info plist is where Jamf draws its application data from. And typically, the application version that's reported back in the Jamf Pro UI is the CF bundle short version string, um, except for when it's not. And the case of when it's not is when the CF bundle name in that info P list contains the word Microsoft. And in which case, the application version equals the CF bundle version. So just bear that in mind when you're doing these sorts of things. Um, and this appeared in Microsoft Remote Desktop 3, uh, 3. Uh, sorry, 10.3.0 or later. 
Um, and so as a consequence, that's a better value. <laughs> yes, that's a much better value. So despite what I said earlier, this is what we want to include. Again, this is a Microsoft-specific thing. So we've got the criteria defined. So let's go back up a level. And our component's done. Now it's time to have a look at the capabilities for this particular patch. So again, which computers in your environment are able to take this particular patch? So we'll go add a value. And in this case, we'll go with the operating system version, because that is basically the key requirement. And we're going to say that it requires Sierra or Hara. So we're good. We're just going to add some kill apps now. Now, this, again, is optional. But in this case, obviously, we would probably prefer that RDC isn't running when we try and patch it. So we'll identify that as something that needs to quit. Also, with this particular example, we just happen to know that auto updater probably shouldn't be running in the background whilst you're trying to update If you're using RDC. it for installer. If no. you're using it for installer, indeed. So we'll go ahead and hit Save. And it's all looking pretty good. So now we're ready to enable this particular patch. So we'll click here to enable it, and we're looking pretty good. We don't see any errors. We've got live feedback. We're good. So we'll jump back up a level. And you can see here at the software title screen that we look ready to go. We can now go ahead and enable this particular software title. So we'll click to enable it. And you'll see here that this is our patch. It's enabled. Again, this looks like a long process, but a lot of this information that, that is actually included in this particular patch title was all auto-populated based on previous information we had entered earlier in the, in the steps. So a lot of effort went into creating this, because we do realize that creating patches, it's very time consuming. And if we can make that process easier for you and less error prone by ensuring that what you enter first off is what becomes uh, populated down the track, um, that's very much um, to your advantage. So. Even with a GUI, however, it's still a fair bit of effort, as you can tell, to go ahead creating a patch. But um, Duncan has a bit more to say about that. Yeah. Um, so primarily, I think I do a lot of things because I'm lazy, and I don't want to do a lot of things more than once. Um, but now I'm doing a lot of things a lot of times. Uh, so what we did with Kenobi, we also put a pin on that um, with uh, like an, an uplift to it. So you can, I guess this is the shameless plug part of the presentation. So we have the ability to subscribe to a patch feed from our servers, um, where we're doing all the work for you. Uh, so you simply go into the settings of Kenobi and enter a subscription key and a URL. It'll ask you to reaccept the license and say you're not going to do any bad things or you know steal our stuff and you know that stuff. Um, and then we have an active subscription up and running. Once that's there, you'll notice in the Kenobi UI some things have changed. Open source has gone away. Um, you have a new logo. And you have a noticeable import button up the top left corner there. So this means that you can punch the import button, select from Kenobi, and subscribe to a patch feed. Now, this will give you a whole bunch of titles and other things like that. You simply search, select, check, and import. It'll come through, and everything's happy. Wi-Fi, not a problem for this demo. <laughs> I'm being facetious. Um, OK, so that's really cool. Uh, and you'll notice that when you go into it, we actually have a, it's got a read-only flag set on an imported definition. Because if you make any modifications to this, when we refresh it at our end, it's going to override anything you've done, with the exception of one thing. Um, override current version, just down here, down the bottom. I don't know whether you can read it or it's fuzzy or anything like that. But you can select that, and this um, I think it should be named override version you want to deploy, but that's a real mouthful. Um, because what you can then do is select an alternate version to be reporting as that latest version for your compliance reporting in Jamf Pro. Um, I know it's a feature request in Jamf Pro. We have solved it at our end. Um, so we've just selected the previous version, because we know that's better than that new one. Um, or we just want to slow updates down and things like that. And you're good to go. And you'll notice that the list has just changed. We've got the older version up there. That will report as the latest version in Jamf Pro. It doesn't matter that the newer version is actually higher up in the list or anything like that within Jamf. It all just reports nicely. Um, so we figured all of that out. Uh, the second thing we've added to this is 
Uh, and by the way, there's also access to the API with a subscription. So you can actually upload a JSON file if you've been creating them somewhere else or you've sourced them from somewhere else and you want to put them into your Kenobi instance and we don't have it in the feed, you can ask us to do it. We'll, we'll do it. Uh, and we'll track historical data and you know just give ourselves a nervous breakdown. Um, but you can upload your own JSON files. Uh, we'll just pick one, a Jamf one, and instantly it goes straight in. Um, just like that. Um, so anyway, using these things in Jamf Pro. We're covering over some basic stuff at the moment, I understand. It's going to get pretty meaty and nerdy towards the end. And I'm watching the clock because I know how long that's going to take. Uh, but there's no questions, fortunately. Uh, so starting off, Gene's going to walk us through the reference materials from the Jamf side of the fence, now that we've got some definitions. Yes, indeed. So um, obviously, we've looked at the patch source side of the equation. So that's all great. We've got our patches loaded. What do we need to do to actually get that into Jamf Pro? So um, it's very, very simple. And Jamf um, has it all documented in their administrator's guide. So this is certainly your friend. Um, there is certainly nothing that um, I'm about to tell you that isn't uh, perhaps more lucidly explained in this uh, particular documentation here. Um, having said that, though, what do you need to do? Well, uh, the first thing is you'll obviously need to tell Jamf Pro about your external patch source. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to jump into the patch management section under computer management in the global settings of Jamf Pro. And we are going to go and add a new external source. Um, you can have multiple. So if you do have multiple um, patch source servers set up, you can certainly add as many um, as you wish. Um, in our case, of course, the uh, server that we were just uh, demonstrating on um, we will just enter the relevant server and port. Um, I will note that with Kenobi, you do need to put the v1.php um, on the end there of the URL. Uh, once not, we a host, not a URL, it's a host name. Host name. <laughs> host name. My apologies. This is, um, that's a support <laughs> ticket for us, because people will put HTTPS at the front of that. Don't do that. Yeah, that don't doesn't do work that. for don't any do patch. Don't want to do that. <laughs> Definitely don't want to do that. That will cause you a lot of problems. Um, so we'll hit save. We're good. So what we're going to do is we're going to test it, because that's always handy. Um, we'll jump into test, and we'll click test. And we're good. Three green ticks, that's what we want to see. You'll also notice that the uh, third and final software endpoint validation check is actually reporting back that we have five titles available. So that's a really good way to sanity check how many titles you expect to see based on what you've put in your external patch source making sure that that's actually what can be seen from the Jamf Pro end. Another comment from the peanut gallery. If you do not have any titles on your patch source, that will error. You have to have at least one active title. Correct. Otherwise, it no worky. So we'll go done. That's all good. Now what we need to do, of course, is import that particular title that we went and created. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump into the computer section of Jamf Pro. And we're going to jump into the patch management section there on the sidebar on the left. And you'll notice that we have uh, two sources now, one from Jamf themselves and one from our um, Kenobi server. So we'll jump into JNUC demo. And you'll notice that we have the five titles, as we were told just before, in the test. And you'll notice that our newly created Microsoft Remote Desktop 10 um, is sitting there in the list for us. So we'll go plus to add it in. And of course, if we want, we can, of course, uh, hit up edit and change the category and notifications if we want. Um, but we could just hit Done, and you'll notice it's sitting there in the list, and you'll get all the relevant reporting. Now, reporting's good, but we probably need to do more than just report on what's out there in your environment. You probably want to actually patch your environment. So what we need to do, of course, at this point is add some installer software to your patch title. So we're going to add a package to that 10.3.4 definition we created. So to do that, we'll jump into the software title itself. And you'll see here that we get a nice little uh, report that, of course, you can uh, pin to your dashboard should you wish. And we will jump into the definitions. And you'll notice here that uh, all of the definitions um, that we've added will populate here in the list. Now, you'll also notice that it does tell you that this software title is not verified by Jamf. Now, um, we can't stress enough. There is an uh, outstanding feature request to allow you to have code signed external patch sources so that these titles can be uh, trusted in your environment. Um, so please I definitely upvote can... this, all of you. Yeah, please, We're please the do. Number now. Um, please make 25 jump up. Um, that would be awesome. So uh, this is a bit of a long-standing, in fact, a 12-month-odd uh, long-standing feature request. So that would be awesome. Um, but having said that, uh, obviously, if it's your own server you're running, uh, you can probably trust your own sources. So uh, having said all that, let's select 10.3.4 in this case, and we'll go Add. 
for the package. And we'll select the 1034 installer that we prepared earlier and click plus, And we've got it added in. Hit save. And we're good. And you can see it there listed under package for 1034. So nearly there, I assure you. Now we're ready to create the actual patch policy. We have to tell Jamf Pro what we want to do with this particular information we've gone and entered. So what we're going to do is we'll jump back into our software title, and we'll jump into the patch policy section, and we're going to create a patch policy for 1034. So what we'll do is we'll add a new patch policy, um, and you can select the target version here, which is quite nice, and also the whether to make it available on self-service or whether to install automatically. That is entirely at your discretion. And what we'll do is, of course, as with everything in Jamf Pro, everything is dictated by scope. So what we will do is we'll obviously change specific computers as the target to all computers. And we'll hit Save and hit Done. And indeed, that's it. We've finally gone from woe to go in creating the patch title definition, setting up Jamf Pro to talk to your patch source, and getting the patch policy created with the relevant installer package all ready to go. Now, could this be maybe a bit simpler, a bit easier to do? Uh, yes, and on that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm full of feature requests today. Uh, <laughs> so getting packages into Jamf Pro. Currently, there is no API for this. Um, but there is an open feature request. Uh, by one of the esteemed Mac admins podcast panel, um, who's unable to reach us, oh, sorry, be here this week. But please upvote this. This one is incredibly important, because if you are looking at in automating these processes, this is actually a key thing for you to do. So uh, I think it's FR 6665. That's the one. Um, and the other thing, like, I mean, there are tools out there to do this at the moment. Um, if you can time travel, just go back to yesterday's lab session where they touched on this. That would be really helpful for you. Um, and it, it, was, it was a great session. We were sitting in the back of the peanut gallery. It was good. Um, or go to Graham's session tomorrow and have a look at using JSS Importer for automating the package management in Jav Pro. So for bringing the stuff in automatically if you're kicking it out of auto package. Um, we're also working on something, but we would like to see official API endpoints before we hack something together, because we don't want it to fall over. Um, and Kenobi Pro is also going to have a bit of a UI for doing everything that we just covered. Um, so the idea of creating the policy and everything like that. So you can actually use the same dashboard that you're using for creating the patch definitions to bringing things in. And saying that, I'm actually going to show you what's under the bonnet. So the, the relevant API calls, or under the hood, I should say. I've got to remember what country I'm in. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to walk you through the relevant API calls that we are using in order to, I say, I guess, craft this for want of a better material. Uh, sorry, better, better word. Uh, first of all. There's a bit of documentation on there, uh, out there at Jamf. Uh, so start with the developer docs at the APIs. Um, there are a couple of holes in there and things like that. I'm going to attempt to fill those today. Uh, there's the uh, classic API docs, which you can go to there, which details everything, which you can also see within your Jamf Pro instance. And uh, what else have we got? Oh, yeah, there's more developer documentation. And I think this one's yeah, just direct API doc documentation as well as the, um, the developer docs. So this details a few things too. Next, um, we have the Jamfro UAPI, or sorry, the Jamfro API, which is commonly called the UAPI, which is the new thing, which is all JSON based. Um, the specific documentation for that. And I will walk you through the user permissions for what we did here. In actual fact, I believe the, is anyone familiar with CRUD? Create, read, update, delete, crud, um, which is what most APIs do. Now, uh, the first one's inaccurate. We're only going to read. We're not going to create anything. But if you wanted to add an external patch server without actually touching the Jamf UI, you can actually do that. And you should be able to interpolate that from what I talked through. So getting straight into things, the classic API, inbuilt Jamf Pro documentation. So in your Jamf Pro um, server, your current instance, just tag, uh, sorry, tap API onto the end of the URL, and you will get here. This shows you a lot of endpoints. Um, 
So that's what they call the documentation. Uh, so performing actions, you need to drop the API out, put JSS resource in, and the, the appropriate route at the tail end of it. Um, and note that when you're using the classic API, you can get the data back in JSON, but make sure you post using XML. It does not accept JSON data. Um, authenticating to it. Uh, this, is, this is where I was, I was having a bit of fun. Uh, this is actually reasonably well documented, but you simply you can do a basic, uh, sorry, were anyone familiar with API authentication methods? So there's, there's basic, uh, there's another one that's in between that's a little bit more secure that uses an encoding key back and forward, but that's not supported in Jamf. Um, yeah, anyway, so basic authentication can be done two ways. You can put a username and password in clear text and send it up. It will go as a header if you're doing an HTTPS connection. It's a little harder to intercept and do anything. Um, this little trick here will generate a base64 encoded string of those credentials, which is what you should put in a script, because your average person, when they glance at it, are not going to be able to read it straight off the cuff, but you can decode it. Um, and then it just changes your authorization header from saying user for curl to actually saying authorization basic, and then the result of that string up there, um, which I thought I put in there, but I didn't. Oh, well, anyway. Um, replaced with your credentials. Uh, so I believe all of the slides and everything are available afterwards, and this stuff is actually in the Jamf documentation. So we can connect to the classic API, and we can do things. Let's just fire a command at it and see what we get back. So first of all, we're doing patch internal sources. Now, until Jamf make another patch server, which I don't think they will, because I mean, you know, they've got one, well, why do any more? Um, you can simply fire that command at at your server, and you'll get back exactly this block of XML, um, which just details what the server is, what its ID is. Um, so you can leverage that source ID later on as you're doing other things. Um, you can do get patch external sources. So if you're looking for external servers, so i.e. your Kenobi server, because you all use our product because it's wonderful, um, you can fire that at at the server, and you'll get back what was represented in the UI as the first item on that list. You can see here I've obviously added it and deleted it because the ID of the, the server is, is incremented just slightly. Um, the numeric IDs that come back from the API are actually incredibly important because it doesn't use any of the named IDs out of the patch definitions. It references IDs from the Jamf Pro database in the back end. Um, so that's a really good thing to remember because we're going to be using quite a few of those as we go through this. All right, um, so we're going to query an ID. So remember, we got back ID number three up there. That's going to get the substitute for the ID on our endpoint here. We're going to fire a curl command at it, and we're going to get back a list. So we're picking on Microsoft Remote Desktop. That's yeah, it's a good enough example. Um, but you can see we get back some information about it, and I'll just sort of expand that out so you can see the entire block of XML. I've truncated the titles above it and below it in the list, but that's the information that presents yourself in the UI for Jamf. Um, so that is representative of that list there, and in particular, that item there. <laughs> now, so that process of clicking, uh, what is it, new plus uh, disclosure arrow, select, add, or save, I think it is, I can't remember the exact button names, you can do with a simple curl command or you can do with a script. So if you are automating this or hooking it up to something else, you can start to add things here. So this is the XML that is in this data block here. So that data block with the patch software title, we want to send it the source ID, where we're getting it from, and the name ID of the title, because that's how it does the external lookup for that from the patch server. And that is the only time we're going to use that. And it will report back that it just created a patch software title of ID3. We'll use that again in a second. Now, that's a bit confusing because we didn't have much stuff in this Jamf Pro server, so we're getting back a lot of low numbers. In fact, I think they're all single-digit integers. But from the UI's perspective, it just did that. So it's a fairly straightforward command that you can query things and send stuff straight through. Now, We can get patch software titles, which is a useful thing, because that's going to send me back the list of it. It's telling me it's Microsoft Remote Desktop. It's currently uh, source ID 3. That's its name ID. But its ID inside the Jamf Pro database is number 3. So we can, um, 
Oh, sorry, I've expanded that out because the XML was truncated and did this with everything. It was really hard to lay out the slide deck. Um, next thing we want to do is we want to get specific information on that title, like all of the information. So we can fire a command at it using the ID from the database, and we get back a lot. Um, and this is way clipped down. It runs right off the page and to wherever. But the important parts here that I wanted to show is we've got a software version and the next tag, which is package. Because what we want to do is associate the package with what we're doing. So we'll hit the Jam Pro API. We'll get a list of packages. Now that comes back with a batch of packages. As you can see, everything's truncated. So we'll expand that out. And we can see we've got 10.3.2, 10.3.3, 10.3.4, 10.3 ID number 3 being 10.3.4, which is the version that we want to push out, the latest version. And so now we can update our patch title. Um, and we can add the policy to it. Because we don't want to replace it or anything like that, we can just use a very simple put command. Now, theoretically, if you had all of the data in advance, you could actually do a post command and add the XML required for this into the previous one we've done. But I wanted to keep this reasonably simple and do the steps one at a time as you would through the UI. So we need some post data to put in there. So we're going to send it software title version, the package ID, the name, everything like that. We're going to post that information back into Jamf Pro. So that's our data tag again. We get back a report that says, oh, it's created, uh, sorry, it's edited software title uh, ID number three. From the UI's perspective, that's what it looks like. So we've just done that drill through set of clicks into the patch definition, and we've added something to it. Um, so that's nice and easy. Uh, we'll get that information again. We'll issue our get command again. And we can see now that we actually have a package association with our software title. So this is starting to get pretty useful. Um, and we pull it out, and we can see everything going on. Now, you can do this multiple times if you have multiple versions of the software up there, and you want test groups and all of those bits and pieces. But once again, trying to keep it relatively simple as we go through this, but just showing what can and can't be done. Now, we want a policy. So this is the next bit, where you're starting to get quite a few clicks deep into Jamf Pro. Um, so this idea here is that we can add some more data around it, which is to create a patch policy. This is the XML I want to add. Um, so I'm not going to enable it to start with. I'm actually just going to give it a, a name. Um, so you could do a test name. You could actually have a production run or anything like that. So you can put multiples in here. You can do two at once. Um, I'm going to distribute by self-service. We fire that in. We get a result back. And Jamf Pro suddenly looks like this. Very easy. These are really simple, straightforward line commands. They're, they're straight up and down curls. Um, so, uh, now, what's this one? Oh, there's lots of these. Um, so this will find all of the policies related to the particular title. So if we had added multiple, po uh, sorry, multiple policies to this via the API, this would report it back to us. Uh, in our case, we only added one, so we should only see one come back. But that's just giving us a short list of the patch policies that are associated with our title. But if you're doing verification steps in your script, this is a really good thing to do. Um, and I'm not going to get into XPath, XML parsing, and stuff like that from the command line in Bash, because it'll just wreck your heads. It's not fair. Um, Next, um, we can search for patch policies. So if you know an ID, you can actually search for it. You can see it. And you, once again, you could do put data against this. But we'll expand that out. So we can see that we actually now have information that was drawn from your patch service source. So this is the information that's contained within the patch definition. Um, so as you can see, that we've got a release date and other things like that. And I probably, I've highlighted the kill apps. So these are the apps that it's going to want to quit during its installation process. Um, so you can actually see those from here, and you're going to know what's going on. You can issue warnings on it and stuff like that. Um, you can get a subset of data. Um, the subset call is very useful. Oh, I will go back one. Did I jump ahead? Um, so a subset of information. So I want to see the scope data of this. Um, so I can see that its scope to all computers is false. Um, and a few other bits and pieces. So what we're going to do is we're going to do update that policy, and we're going to give it the scope, which is we're going to turn it on. So we're doing two things at once. And we're going to scope it to all computers. So this is a, a straightforward thing. So now we've done quite a few things that we were doing in the UI with 
a series of API commands, and I think it's nine all in all. Um, there were some sanity checks in there to make sure things were OK, but I just wanted to highlight that you can push information in, and you can get information out, and you can modify information. Very important. You can also delete them if you're really feeling enthusiastic. Um, so that's doable, too. Um, so we've fed our XML data in. We've punched in the put command. And it's come back, and it's told us what policy ID it's updated. And now Jamf Pro should look like this. Uh, so we've got our enable checkbox. And we've got a scope to all computers, just like that. Next. Um, this one's a little bit different. So I'll start here. So the, the inbuilt documentation lives at your Jamf Pro server UAPI. Uh, sorry, yeah, UAPI and doc from there. Uh, so this is the basic look, on, look and feel of it. It's a Swagger-based UI. And you can see that we have a username and password up there to generate a token. Now, I'm going to get into that because um, I was having great difficulty finding the documentation around that. So I, I will get back into that a lot. Um, so you perform actions using U, UAPI and the route. And lastly, there's a little hidden thing up here, which is the schema. So you can actually see API endpoints that are not published on the previous page that I showed you. Uh, and that's kind of useful, because this is where I figured out the entire authentication method from. And this uh, was fun. So it uses a token. That little text form you've got up at the top will generate you a, uh, an OAuth token for talking to the API. And you'll need to post against the UAPI using basic auth to get it. So we can do our username and password, or we can do our trick from before, and we can send some basic cred credentials across the wire. And you will get back something that looks like this. Uh, so effectively, that string of stuff up there is a, um, an OAuth token that allows you access into the UAPI. And it's time limited. Uh, so it'll expire. The timestamp there is actually 30 minutes after you hit that post command. And that value inside the quotes for the token is what you're going to need to send in to the UAPI in order to get anything out. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes? No? Did I go too fast? So you authenticate to then authenticate. Um, <laughs> which is good. Security, security, security. The next thing is that you may do something in a few seconds, and you want to kill that session off and not leave the token open. So if you fire with your token at the UAPI slash or slash invalidate token, that will immediately nuke that. And then it can't be used again. So you would have to recreate another one to perform an initial set of commands. But you can generate a token at the start of a script, and then you can use that token and then destroy it at the end, um, is the way I do it. Um, so the other thing I'd like to note about this from the perspective of patch is that um, the UAPI is mostly reporting functionality at the moment. If you want to use it for other things, there's a lot of other really cool stuff in there that you can do. It takes JSON, which is far easier to understand, parse, and use than XML. Um, in most languages, XML I, f I find to be very primitive and annoying. And, and stuff. But um, so this is good. So we, we need some JSON data. Oh, sorry, we get some JSON data back from it. That's its default variation. Um, that looks like this. So I've just queried it, reported back a bit about the software title ID. And it's subtly different to what you see out of the, um, the classic API. So you may be wanting to leverage this for doing different reports or reporting types and things like that. Um, so I'm just sort of uncovering a few things here. I'm not going to dive into it too deeply, because it's mostly just reporting information that you would want to pass. Um, so you can get a bit of information from patch policies. Some of the, the good stuff out of here, when I say reporting, what's waiting to be executed, what's completed, what's been deferred, and what fell over. So you can get a lot of information from here. Uh, and that reporting is not available in the classic API. Um, you can get various versions out there. Sorry, I'm standing in front of things again. Um, so the versions available in the package. So we only have one enabled. Uh, so we have one version that has a package associated with it and the subsequent patch policy that goes with it. Um, what's next? Um, we can check the policies that are associated with that thing that we were having a look at. So we got our policy ID back from the previous slide, I believe. I can't see the previous slide now. And that gives us some more information that tells us how we're deploying it, all of that sort of stuff, and exactly what's going on with the policy. Now, I've run this about five minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> 
Um, so are there any questions? Whoa. Do we have any questions? And if you do, please come up to the microphones. Because I'm happy to answer them. I've just scratched the surface here a little bit. Nope. We have nothing. Well, I guess we're done then. Um, <laughs> we can listen to the podcast and then go have a beer. That's it. Being an Australian, we like doing that. Thanks, guys. Thanks.